is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and today, Stu and I are chatting with Adam Vass, the mastermind behind World Champ Game Co., as well as artist Sally Canarino, two of the amazing creatives behind a brand new game called Cobwebs, which is dropping on Kickstarter tomorrow, January the 28th. So without further ado, let's get into it with Adam and Sally. Hey, Adam. Hey, Sally. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us on. Well, we are stoked that you're here. We're even more stoked to talk about your new upcoming Kickstarter for Cobwebs. Yeah, I'm very excited and very nervous, but mostly excited to talk about it. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about it? You've done a great job online really kind of promoting the spookiness and the kind of mysteriousness behind it and now that tomorrow is the day that it does come out why don't you let everyone know what they have in store if they pre-order cobwebs the hell with the listeners hambone i want to know i'm dying to know what this game is about <laughs> wait he hasn't spilled the beans to you offline no oh, well then i'm, glad I'm very polite i don't i try not to like pry 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 <laughs> trying to distill this to as brief as possible and i think that's part of the reason that it might feel like you don't know what's going on maybe it's just a mystery that needs to be solved and that's what the game is about cobwebs is a neo-noir investigation game about someone who goes missing and your play group inhabiting the role of one shared protagonist who's named the darling in the game who goes on this journey to find what happened to this missing person. And the more information you learn, the more danger you are in, as well as the people that you sort of wrapped up into your investigation, whether they be friends or suspects or relatives, everyone's sort of in this downward spiral together. And there's elements of conspiracy and a lot of sort of like bigger picture mystery stuff that usually unfolds in that investigation. And there's also sort of paranormal elements that pop up pretty often. Everyone's sort of working together to find out the answer. There isn't preset answers in a book or anything that you're working towards. So the solutions often get pretty out there in a way that everyone contributed to, but no one could have really seen coming until it's finally revealed, which is really (laughs) exciting. So how does the game work? Is it based on prompts then? There's a cloth play mat, which is really great and nice. And it serves... All these different functions where you're keeping track of your time and your danger as it escalates, you're mapping the people that you meet and how well you trust them and also how close they are to imminent danger themselves. And then the right half of the play mat is a die drop table. So every player rolls dice at the same time. And depending on the numerical result of the dice and where it lands within this semicircle, they're a combination of scene prompts and sort of goals for that scene, but then you sort of calibrate with one another once you have that information and you work to get all the pieces together. You decide who or what you're investigating, who's acting as the NPCs, which is a character called the Shadow in this game system. You kind of meet up, put your heads together, and then act out scenes generated by these randomizers and also whatever things interest you the most in that moment. Yeah, I was really excited when I saw the images of the cloth board, and I was kind of hoping that it wasn't just a, hey, this is kind of what the demo board looks like. The real board's going to look like something completely different. It makes me even more excited to know that that's like a legit DIY-looking cloth board. Yeah, I actually uh, printed one out on paper and drew on a cloth piece so it's actual size. I drew it with a Sharpie. I even tried to get some of the like splatter texture and the Xerox copy kind of texture emulated with the Sharpie pen so that my prototype looked as close to the final as possible. So there's a lot of character, a lot of really neat just like presence around the table. I was lamenting after being at a convention last year that all the photos afterwards were just 
four or five people sitting at a table because <laughs> so much of these games take place in your imagination and in the conversation. And I was really inspired to have something that physically was there in front of you and looked really cool. Yeah, it's nice to have an artifact, right? Just like from your perspective, because like you get to see people around it, but also from my perspective, because like we get to have like a cool cloth play mat. I love it. Yeah. It reminds me of when I bought Pocket Dungeon Quest and I was really excited to see that the board was actually made of cloth as well. It's like a canvas and everything on it is printed like really cool, but you can kind of fold it up nice and stuff it back in the box. Yeah, there's something really interesting about cloth. I something feel a lot like more personal. Yeah. I remember like video games used to have like the tea cloth maps. Oh, yeah. And I don't know why that's so appealing, but it is. It's a warmth. I feel like boards are cold. Boards are kind of cold. So, Adam, how many players is this game for? The game is designed specifically for three players, but it can go up to five players. There's special rules in the book to accommodate those. Basically, the four and five player version of the game has certain players doubling up or working together in like a shared role capacity, whereas three players is like the tight design focus for one player to act as the protagonist, another to sort of act generally as the antagonist or just NPCs specifically. And then the third player who is called the machine kind of taking the role of director or game master and they operate as the setting and sort of the surrounding areas of the context of the investigation. But each of those roles shifts over the course of the game. So everyone ends up performing them. I feel like that's a common kind of story game mechanic not just that the roles shift, but every role is part of the machinery of the game. You don't have like a centralized DM running the NPCs. You have like the NPC person doing that. For you, where did that come out of? So specifically with this design, I wanted that rotating responsibility, partly because I think it's very difficult to be a game master for a mystery game because you either are withholding of clues and secrets because you are trying to control the pace and you don't want someone to solve it early. Or in the opposite, like they're your friends and you want to set them up. Maybe you give them a clue that they haven't earned yet. There's a lot of pacing issues with one person knowing the solution and everyone else trying to get there. So that was the main impetus was I needed this to be a game that not one person was in total control and not one person knew the solution that everyone was working towards. And then I sort of worked backwards from there. I also considered the fact that in an investigation, you always want to be the person who cracks the case, right? You don't want to be the person's assistant or, you know, even a player character who contributed, but maybe like didn't get it. And then the ending is spoiled and you're kind of left out of that moment of joy or that Eureka kind of moment. But since this is shared again, everyone kind of finds this conclusion as a group. And it's almost like a movie that you're watching together and you're creating in real time instead of, the success or failure of any individual player. That's super cool. That's a really great solution because like by sharing the game master role, nobody knows what's going to happen because it's constantly shifting. It's evolving yeah. as it unfolds. That's wild. I like games when there's a collaborative storytelling element. And a nice thing about this is like when you change roles and with each different group of people you play with, the storytelling experience will be different. So Sally, why don't you tell us a little bit about the art? Because this game is somewhat shrouded in mystery and it is a noir game. What is the art like? And what can we expect to see once we open the box? It's kind of interesting how we're setting it up because it's going to be in this box and Adam has designed the outside of it and I'm doing the interior illustrations. So I'm making this artwork that contributes to the world that's being built. I'm trying to capture this atmosphere and capture some of Adam's design sensibilities on the exterior and translate that in. My art tends to run a little spooky. Like I love horror, so I feel like it's a good fit. I've worked with Adam before and felt like it was a good fit as well. So I look forward to everybody seeing the final product. You worked on Protest Singer, right? I did. I worked on Protest Singer with Adam two years ago. I've sort of been in touch with Adam over the years, and in 2018, he reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to do some illustrations for a game, and Protest Singer was the one that fit my style and subject matter the best. I work as a comic artist, as a sequential artist primarily, so any chance I get to do 
illustrations is a nice change of pace, a nice opportunity to work a different set of muscles. All right. So speaking of stretching your muscles, coming from your spooky style, this I'd imagine is going to be very cinematic, being that it is based on noir. How does it feel to work on a project like this? What are you kind of bringing to the art style of cobwebs? So it's black and white, kind of a throwback to zines. I'm pulling in that photocopy texture that Adam is using on the play mat and on the exterior of the box and playing with different textures, different screen tones, different grungy patterns and textures on the artwork. It's very graphically black and white. So I feel like the box is a super interesting part of this because it takes the zine aesthetic and then puts it in a box. And I don't feel like zines come in boxes very often, but, you know, it's a box, so there's a mystery of what's in it. What's in the box? Yeah, hopefully it's not a severed head. That'd be a lot of severed heads if it's a successful Kickstarter. You know what? That's on Matt at Exalted's funeral, not on us. So he's the one who's got to get all the severed heads. He has to supply the heads. Oh, boy. I feel like that's up his alley. Yeah. I'm supplying the artwork. Adam's supplying the game. Matt's supplying the severed heads. It's a Jeez. team effort. I love collaboration. Sally, you're from New Jersey. Allegedly. Allegedly. It's an allegedly a team workout. <laughs> but to speak on the box, it was... Both a crime of convenience because the game has components, which a lot of role-playing games don't, or, you know, they're, they ship as a book. Stu knows well, I've done plenty of those anyways. But this game required just more to it. And I also really like the appeal of something that you can play right out of the box. It has everything that is necessary inside. It's going to have custom dice. It's going to have tokens that you use for the time and, and danger measurements. And obviously the play mat and the rule book, it would be a rude thing to give someone that much stuff and nothing to contain it so the box is really neat in that way but then also like you said the box almost feels like an in fiction relic this thing that you maybe aren't supposed to have access to that you found and i think that's a thing that comes up a lot in the sort of xerox texture thing that we play with and the kind of almost an alarming like palette of the exterior artwork and the kickstarter page and everything so i wanted it to feel like not quite forbidden but you've stumbled upon something that you shouldn't maybe have stumbled upon and you can't help but find out what the next step is. Like a serial killer dropped his notebook or you happen upon the video cassette from The Ring. How could you possibly <laughs> either of those things and not watch the tape, or not open the notebook, right? Totally. You have to know the next, even if it endangers you. And that's a major theme of the game, this sort of curse of knowledge. If your friend went missing and you lamented them and you never look, then you could just live the rest of your life safe and sort of ignorant. And the second you start to find out more information is when things ramp up and you find yourself in a bad spot. I love it. I love when satisfying your curiosity is directly opposed to your self-interest. Well, he just got my wallet open. (laughs) I do just want to mention also that while it is based in noir. It's not a game set in the 50s. It's set in current day. Not that the 50s aesthetic bothers me at all. I actually really like that. But I think, especially in terms of noir and mystery stuff in tabletop, it's a well-trodden path. And I'm going more for a modern aesthetic. One of the most inspirational pieces of media for this game was a podcast that's now a TV series called Limetown. And it also pulls a lot from the Matt Kent comic Mind Management. So these people have cell phones and access to the internet, and none of that's going to save them. (laughs) Yeah, imagine if there were corporations that were nearby the forest from Blair Witch. So you have this urban danger and sort of rural suburban creepiness that are adjacent to one another. I mean, that's North Jersey. Yeah. You could find that exact landscape somewhere in North Jersey. Yeah, like I'm thinking of like three places in Belleville right now. like <laughs> Off the top of my head without even flinching. <laughs> <laughs> There's this pretty big highway, 17, that has a field in Hasbrook Heights that has like a tractor right on the highway. Just chilling. <laughs> and it's like a cornfield. It's like, what? Something bad happened there. Yeah, and then if you take it in the other direction, head towards MetLife Stadium, formerly Giant Stadium, it's swamp. Yeah. So plenty of places to hide a body. <laughs> Allegedly. (laughs) 
I look forward to hearing your play report on the North Jersey Cobwebs game session. <laughs> like, I appreciate the 50s aesthetic too, but like, it's a barrier to entry, right? Like, if you set it in the modern world, it's like the world everybody knows. So it's easier to kind of improvise and immerse, right? Yeah. And also with role playing, it becomes a thing, I think, where you look at it from the standpoint of like, you don't have to put on a funny accent or like Google some fun words to say to try to immerse yourself in it. It's like you can pull out your phone, you could play along and you know where allegedly the bodies are already buried. Yeah. So you have a clear thought in your mind. Yeah, the people I've played with so far, for the most part, aren't familiar with the podcasts, the comics and stuff that I was inspired by. And it was really awesome to watch them just get into the game without necessarily needing the trope history that I think 50s noir almost necessitates. Like you said, we just dove in. We even set our fiction in the town that we all lived in. So it felt very natural. All of the resources that were available to our character are available to us in reality. And it didn't seem like such a far-fetched mystery to try to solve ourselves. There's an appeal to that. Like when I run Tales from the Loop, I said it right here. You yep. know, we all grew up here. And even though it's the 80s in that game, like it's easier to just kind of go in and run. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be hung up on details. Well, because it's a visual type of storytelling insofar as when you say, hey, you were at this pet store or you were in this park, we've all been there. Or we've at least seen the outside of the building and we all are immediately taken to that place. Yeah, or that weird field on Route 17 with the tractor that's You are cursed. obsessed with that. It's creepy and weird. Yeah. <laughs> and it has a creepy and weird diner by it, too. Yeah. Do tractors figure into the game? Is there like a farming angle? In the beginning, when you set up the game, everyone is contributing locations and items sort of in secret. And then over the course of the game, you choose which ones you want to investigate further. So you could include the tractor either as a location because you know exactly where it is or as an item that you want to learn more about. I'm all in. Yeah. Now I'm going to put a secret creepy tractor in the uh, finished artwork just, <laughs> just for, for me. You. Off uh, in the distance, I love this. In the background, just a single <laughs> ominous tractor. Oh my god! <laughs> so what... dragging it right off the rails, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the Kickstarter launches on January twenty eighth. Correct. What can we look forward to with this Kickstarter? Are there incentives? Are there different tiers once you launch it? How's this working? The Kickstarter pledges are actually really straightforward in that you can get the PDF. You can get the physical game that comes with the PDFs, or there's a custom tier where you get the physical game, the PDF, and I write a quick start scenario for you. And those are limited so that I don't punish myself <laughs> later on. But Let's get this out of the way. How much is that one? Because that's probably the one I'm zeroing in on. I think it was $60. Oh, that's reasonable. And you just opened Stu's wallet. I wanted a pledge level that... If someone had the means and wanted to support a little extra, they could. But something that was really important to me in developing the game was that there wasn't a standard and a deluxe edition because I wanted the standard to be the deluxe edition, especially with, like I mentioned, the cloth play mat and there's like metal pieces, the metal token. I wanted to make it really nice. There was never a stage of development where I was like, maybe I could use cardboard here instead of metal, or maybe the play mat could just be a big piece of paper, like a poster that's folded up. So all along, it was kind of the best iteration that it could be. But I do have a couple secrets that if the game funds and overfunds quickly, I could make it even more supreme, and then everyone would benefit from that. But I'm holding those close to the chest because I'm one... Still nervous about funding initially. But two, I don't want to say something that I regret later and then have to <laughs> uh, adapt to. What tier do we have to pledge to to get a severed head from Matt? Oh. <laughs> I'll have to see what a severed head is going for these days. Wholesale. That's actually a good question, too. Exalted Funerals uh, handling the printing or distro, or what's the connection? They're fulfilling for me. Exalted Funeral is doing the fulfillment. And assembly and everything. Nice. And we've been trying to figure out too how I can get up to Idaho and like help him assemble all these bits and pieces into the boxes, partly as a fun trip hangout thing. And also because there are a lot of pieces that go in this little box. So <laughs> to lighten the load for Exalted and Matt and his wife. But yeah, they've been really helpful. They're actually the ones hosting the Kickstarter campaign. This will be 
Actually, I think it's both of our thirds. It's definitely my third campaign. And I think it might also be theirs. So hopefully third time's a charm and we can knock this out of the park. But because I have a somewhat limited audience on my own and I put out the rallying cry whenever I'm on Kickstarter and it works out to varying degrees so far, you know, knock on wood. Matt and I have been working together for a long time and he was always a big supporter of my work even when I was just making postcard games and stuff. I was hoping that if this was a bigger production, a bigger deal game, that that infrastructure that Exalted has now might benefit the people who want access to the game and not just me shipping stuff out of my apartment closet. You still sound nervous, and I think that's interesting because both of your previous Kickstarters funded and did pretty well. Like, Do you think that the Kickstarter nerves ever go away? Yeah, I hope the nerves go away, but I think the anticipation is always the worst part, and I'm deep in the anticipation. I also have a tendency to take on or put a lot of my own work on my plate and not ask for help, even though I have this really great team of Sally and Exalted working with me. I don't want to pass the buck off to anyone. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to do the graphic design for the page. I'm going to make the video. Maybe I should make a song that goes in the background of the video. Every stage, I put that weight on my own shoulders and there becomes an inevitable time in the Kickstarter campaign where that weight starts to uh, break my back and I I have to ask for help. Thankfully, it seems like that happened before the campaign launched this time (laughs) and I'm back in a better place now and have people helping me where I need help. So fingers crossed that this is the last of the nerves and the Kickstarter campaign launching will just be a success story. So what are the dimensions of the box? Because I need to clear space in my shelf. (laughs) The interior dimensions are six inch square. Okay. The rule book is a six inch square. The play mat actually is a 22 inch square, but because it's cotton, it'll just fold down real nice and just fit in the box. Another benefit of cloth. Yeah, it's malleable. So I would say if you have a six and a quarter square inch space on your shelf. I got a spot in mind already. (laughs) Right under that tractor. (laughs) Adam, do you have any final thoughts on your Cobwebs Kickstarter? Just that I hope that the people who are listening find that interesting enough to check out and hopefully even more interesting enough to pledge for. It's a game that I'm very fond of. I make a game almost every month, and I think this might be my favorite game that I've made so far. I'm really championing this game specifically and putting a lot into it. I hope a lot of people get something out of that. Your pace is mind-boggling in terms of like how many things that you produce in a given span of time. And this one seems a little bit more ambitious, and I hope it really goes well. I finished another zine game this morning and had the thought of maybe I'll take a break now. Maybe I earned one. <laughs> you know what, Adam? I think now's the time where you get the business cards made that say, Adam Voss, hardest worker man in board games. <laughs> no one would dispute that. I mean, it's in the name, World Champ Games. He really is the world yeah. champ. Yeah. Yeah, self-proclaimed, but now I maybe earned it. (laughs) So, Adam, where can our listeners find you? My website is worldchampgame.co, and you can sign up for my mailing list there. I'll send out a blast the day that we launched the campaign, so if you're listening to this hours before, um, you'll get that reminder. But there's also a store there where I sell all of my zines and other packaged games. I'm on Twitter at WC Game Co. way too often talking about game theory and all the other stuff I have coming up. And lastly, I'm also on Patreon. As I mentioned, I'm doing almost a game a month. And that is patreon.com slash worldchampgameco. And that's the cheapest way to get a lot of the physical editions of the games that I make. And also generally the most supportive because I just take all of the Patreon money and I use it for printing and more game making. So it directly contributes to more games. I'm a happy patron, and folks, it is worth every penny. So Sally, do you have any final thoughts on Cobwebs? I do. I'm really excited to work with Adam again. I was very excited about the concept when he reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to do the illustrations. I was super excited to have this put out through Exalted Funeral. I spend too much money ordering stuff from Exalted Funeral. So does Stu. Seriously. Sally, where can our listeners find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at This Quiet City. And you can find my comics and zines up for sale at gumroad.com slash ink and destroy. 
Well, I know I can speak for Stu when I say we can't wait to get cobwebs in our hands. So, dear listener, once you get done with this episode, jump on Kickstarter January 28th and make sure you kickstart cobwebs from World Champ Game Co. So, Adam, Sally, thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you so much for having us on. Yeah, it was a real pleasure as someone who listens and also follows Vintage RPG to now be kind of actively part of it. So it was really cool. Thanks so much to Adam Vass and to Sally Canarino for joining us today on the podcast. Make sure you check out Cobwebs on Kickstarter starting January 28th, 2020. For Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 